I'm Carl King, and welcome to the Carl King Podcast, where we talk about music, filmmaking, and general creativity stuff. To support this podcast, head over to patreon.com slash Carl King and pledge $1 or $5 a month. Special thanks to both Chubode and Hank Howard III for their massive Patreon support of $50 a month. Quick shout out to my music endorsements, Vienna Symphonic Library, Fractal Audio, Ernie Ball Strings, Tune Track, and Millennium Media. They all make amazing musical gear that I love to use. In this first ever episode of the Carl King Podcast, what better way to explore creativity than with Steve Vai? He's a massive personal inspiration and my favorite musician of all time. We talk about why he makes music, his perspective on free will, what books he's currently reading, his methods for composing, Perfect Pitch and Dylan Bieto's superhuman abilities, Mr. Vi's love of modern classical music, and his upcoming concert with the American Youth Symphony at Disney Hall. This is going to be a good episode, so let's begin to get started. I'm here on the internet telephone with Mr. Vi. Say hello, Mr. Vi. Hey, hey, hello, Mr. Vi. <laughs> <laughs> so I've always seen you as a composer that happens to play guitar, and I'd like to talk to you about composition today because I think that often gets overlooked. Sure, yeah. First, I'd like to talk about why you do what you do. So do you feel that you have a personal, spiritual, maybe even religious reason for being compelled to compose? I mean, do you feel like you need to do it for a deeper reason than just making cool sounds? Well, my perspective on that has changed through the years. There's always been a move forward with composing and making music. And the, the reason for me, I think, is similar to the reason for a lot of people. There's just an enjoyment in it. There's a vision. There's a, when you get a good idea for something that feels uh, compelling to you, you have a pull to just create it, you know. And that's always, always been at the forefront of anything I've done. It's very, very simple kind of a concept. An inspiration arises within you, and then you move forward to do it. Now, that's happening with everybody all the time, but the way that you perceive it is as different as there are people in the world. Some people attribute it to their intelligence or their study, their culture, or God, or you know their purpose in life, whatever it is. There's something within every one of us that has this momentum and this uh, uh, desire to create. As far as the way I've viewed that through the years, I've attributed different characteristics to it in my head, and they've changed, you know? But at the bottom of it all, it's a very simple arising of inspiration and then bringing it into the world, bringing your creative visions into the world. And we're, we all do it, you know? Uh, they go through the screen of your own perspective, meaning wherever you're at at any point in your life in regards to how you view the world or how you view yourself, which is the same thing. The intention of the creative process that you're working on, that is different for everybody. But before that is a creative impulse. So when you start talking about religion or spirituality and how that equates or how it, how it works into the creative process. Well, there's as many perspectives on that as there are people, <laughs> you know? And the thing is, is they're all right. Everybody's correct because the universe can create anything. It's infinite and you are the universe. And when you perceive something a particular way, it becomes your truth. And then you see things in the world that resonate with what you're creating as your truth. So, uh, you know, that's kind of a esoteric answer there, but, uh, when I look at it, I look at it as in its simplest form. You, when, and you, all you got to do is look at it without any perception, which is pretty difficult because everything you look at, you have a perspective. But when you take your perspective out and you just look at it, you realize that there has been this momentum of expansion that the universe is, is doing. Okay, So you know, scientists discover this. You just look out into the cosmos and you can see everything is kind of expanding. And we came from that. We, we are an extension of the expansion of the universe. There's, there's really no debating that because 
it's too obvious. We're here. <laughs> you know, we came from the universe. Now, what is it that evolved into human beings? Uh, where we're at right now is it's consciousness, basically. You know, there's this creative momentum that the, it's it's sort of like the creative impulse of the universe, so to speak. And it created us. And when it created us, it endowed us somehow with the ability to create. So anything that we do creatively, we're expanding the universe. <laughs> you know, it's, the, the universe is expanding through us. We think we're doing it, but it's actually a co-creative effort with the universe. Now, you can attribute that to any perspective, be it a religious one, a spiritual one, or whatever. But at this point in my life, to answer your question, the way I see it um, is in its simplest form, which is creative impulses arise in you when you create an opening for them in you, and they, they arise as impulses and and inspired ideas. And then you go and you create them. You, one can call the creative impulse of the universe God. <laughs> one can call that dimension where that infinite dimension of potentiality that is within us all, you can call that God, you can call it the universe, call it whatever you want. But I don't call it anything anymore. I just see it as a, a beautiful responsibility. <laughs> I don't, I don't like using the word responsibility because it sounds like something you have to do that you don't want to do. It's a privilege to create. And that's what I think we're here for. That's an excellent answer. And uh, we probably won't go down this particular road much far, uh, farther on this topic, but it sounds almost like what Sam Harris says about that there is evidence that we don't actually have free will and that we are, you know, a consequence of everything that's happened before us and that free will is yeah, an illusion. I've read Sam's books and there's, uh, what, what he writes resonates with me. He's saying things that are at the core of the teachings of you know, all the great avatars from the past. And I, I absolutely, I'm starting to see that now, that you don't have to do anything. It will do it through you if you allow it. And that's kind of what Sam is saying. And he's also, he's stating very many spiritual principles, but it goes through his perspective. So there's a political bend to it all. You know what I mean? Because when you yes. read his books, you see that uh, he's touching on the eternal, but he's applying it to other people's beliefs and why they're wrong. And um, I, I like his writings, but I, I, I don't go down that direction, in a sense. I have to ask, how much do you uh, read? I mean, I'm quite surprised to hear that you read Sam Harris. Uh, so do you, is there a, do you read before bed, or is there a, a normal I amount? don't read. <laughs> I don't read books at all. I can't remember the last book I read. I listen to them. I, I use audio books because I, I just, if I read, it, it means I have time to sit around. And if I'm sitting around, it's usually like on an airplane and I'm usually writing music or listening to music or listening to an audio book. I'll read occasionally, but I find that listening works really good for me. When I'm working out, when I'm running, you know, things like that. When, when I'm doing things that I have time to listen Ah, that's very interesting. Okay. Which, is, which is quite often, yeah. It's, today, I worked out, and, you know, it was about 45 minutes, and I'm listening to a book right now for the third time. It's called A Course in Miracles. Uh, who is that by, by the way? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not, a, you know, metaphysically speaking, I'm not, uh, I don't follow channeled work very much. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I shouldn't say that, but The Course in Miracles is actually a channeled piece of um, literature. And it was cha channeled by this woman, Helen Schiffmeyer, back in, I think, the 70s. And uh, it's a fascinating, it's, a, it's actually a miraculous phenomenon. It just resonates with me. It's, very, it's kind of Christian-oriented, in a way. It uses Christian terminology. But one of the things I've recognized, with all the stuff I read and whatever, that the terminology may be different whether it's Buddhism or Christianity or uh, Sa Sam Harris or Eckhart Tolle or Krishnamurti or, you know, the Sargadatta, the, it, only, they're all pointing to one thing, just one thing. And um, when you start to understand what that one thing is, you start seeing it. And what you realize is that every teaching, every, if it's a religion or whatever, is fine because within it, somebody 
understands at their capability what they're being presented. You know what I mean? So everybody ha is at a different level of, of development and understanding, and whatever they pick is right for them at that time. So within that lies the seed of allowing people their beliefs without having to challenge them, and that's freedom. Okay. We'll now move into more of the topic of composition. This is probably more of an interesting way to go with this than the actual questions that I had, but you know, maybe some more connections will arise here. Yep. The next know. question is, uh, there are a lot of methods for composing, and uh, I've seen that you write stuff while you're jogging, uh, experimenting during sound check. Hoping you could maybe name some examples of pieces you've written using various methods. Sure, yeah. Well, methods will change based on the person that's looking for them, you know, and using them. And everybody has different methods. And I, I try not to limit myself to one method. It might be something somebody says that inspires something in you to write, or it might be something you hear. Usually that's a big one. You know, you hear music or you see an artist that you really resonate with. And they, you, next thing you know, you're like, I want to write a song like that. You know, that's, that's pretty, a pretty big inspiration for a lot of uh, musicians. Sometimes I just sit and play and look for interesting, weird things that come out. But the main method that I use if I want to do something kind of uh, uh, grandiose, it's a wonderful method, and it works for me every time. <laughs> uh, I imagine it. I, I imagine something. You know, I, I create a feeling about it. And then I, um, I allow the cooperative components to be presented to me. So I'll give you an example. Oh, my gosh. Well, most of my stuff is an example. But, uh, okay, all right, here's one. I have done a lot of work with the Metropole Orchestra in Holland and the North Netherlands Orchestra in Holland. The way it started out was, it's, you know, as you know, it's difficult for a rock musician to get their music performed by an orchestra, but it was something I always wanted through my life. And eventually, at some point, I have a, uh, my friend, Code Clute, who's been my friend for, you know, since 1980, was working at M uh, NPR in Holland. You know, he, was, he came to me and he said, you know, Steve, I like the way you play guitar, but I think that there's a composer in there that hasn't had an opportunity to really be seen. So he put together this beautiful concert well it was like five concerts and i had composed all this orchestra music and recorded it and it was um released as uh, sound theories which is my double live orchestra record and as a result of that other orchestras around the world were interested then in having me compose for them and perform with them and the north netherlands ones uh, north netherlands orchestra was one of the first ones on board they commissioned me to compose a symphony and i did and uh, and then another one because they liked it so much and then another one so each time you go to do this it's many months of intensive work but it's what i love the third time which was the last time that they asked me to compose something i was on the story of light tour what this is method now that i'm going to tell you so i actually create a list for this particular piece i created a list of the things the elements the feelings that I wanted this piece of music to uh, have within it. So I wrote, first of all, I needed to have an easy guitar part <laughs> because I was in the middle of the tour and I had to take five months off to compose this piece. What people want usually is a uh, crazy guitar shredding part over an orchestra, you know, and I've done that and I wanted to do something different. So actually the first thing on the list was write a unique piece of music, write something that's unique to you, and maybe to the world, you know? So that's a, that's a tall order, but hey, the universe can do anything, you know? So that was <laughs> first on my list. Now, the trick is in the belief that you can do it. That's the thing that stops people. You're only gonna create based on the extent of your belief that you can. So I know instinctively that anything that I wanna create can be created. This piece of music, I know that it's possible for me to create something unique because it's possible for anybody. It's what we're actually supposed to be doing, you know? So that was the first line, something that ha it has to have something unique in it. And the guitar part has to be really easy because I wasn't going to have time to write uh, 20 minutes of crazy guitar playing and then learn it, you know, that's huge. So then I also wanted it to have great beauty and in an intense, uh, um, chaoticism at times, you know, 
And so I, I just wrote this list with all these things. Now, I had no idea what this piece of music was going to be. And the timing needed to be perfect because I had things before it and after it, and the gigs were already uh, booked for the orchestra shows. But I knew that at some point, the inspiration for this piece of music was just going to come. And it did. And I remember exactly when it did. I was, because <laughs> this is how inspiration can work. You know, it, it can come at any time and you just got to be ready to grab it and identify it. And the way you identify it is the way it makes you feel when the idea comes. If it feels like enthusiasm and like that aha moment and the feeling of excitement, then you know that it came from the <laughs> intimate well of uh, creativity that resides in all of us. So I was go getting into my car and I was putting the key in the door and all of a sudden the entire, the entire vision for this piece of music, just, it was just there. It was, at, it was as if it was always there and it was like low-hanging fruit, but I, I, I just was missing it. And then all of a sudden, boom. And it was su such a powerful uh, realization, so to speak, that I actually... <laughs> But I actually got weak in the knees, and I, I, I had to catch myself from hitting the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea was to create a piece of music that had me performing one note and holding it with a sustainer for 20 minutes. <laughs> and the, the idea was, it's kind of a little more complicated. There's a three-note uh, motif. And this was actually the second part of a huge orchestral piece that I had written previously for them. And in the previous piece, which was called um, The Middle of Everywhere, there was, uh, it was a three-note motif, and, and I applied certain concepts to it. Same kind of deal. I said, I want something unique. I want something interesting. And what I came up with was creating this huge piece of music with the relationship of these three notes, but with, with no rhythmic counterpoint in the whole piece so at no at, at no time is one note any longer or shorter than any others that are appearing <laughs> and i knew that would create sort of a tension you know a rhythmic rigid kind of a tension and it did and uh so i thought when i do the second part which was the one that i laid down all the inspiration for which was the one that the inspiration came for me when i was putting the key in the door it's the second part, and what it is is I play those, that three-note motif, and it goes da-da-da, and I hold that F. And I saw myself holding that note for the entire piece of music. Now, one might think that that's easy to do, but within the concept, the performance of holding that one piece was very important, that one note was very important, because I couldn't move a muscle. I, it, it, it written into the part is holding that note, without moving your body one bit and just keeping your attention intensely in the note. And with slight eye movements and a little vibrato here and there, once that note starts ringing, then the other, the other instruments come in on that note and then they slowly start to divide and the rhythmic counterpoint then starts developing. Now, when you have one note, the entire piece of music that, that the orchestra is playing in back of it, this was all part of the uh, realization that came in that one moment, would be ebbing and flowing and creating tremendous amounts of different textures and colors of that one note. Because, you know, if it's an F and it's in a, you know, a, a particular chord, it's going to sound another way. And then if it's an F in another chord, it sounds another way, and et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm doing with this piece of music is inviting the listener to meditate on that one note and the peripheral, which would be the harmonic atmosphere, melodic atmosphere that's being set up around that note and basically dictating uh, peripherals of that note, the, audio, the, the harmonic peripherals are going on by the orchestra through what I'm, what I'm going to compose for them. So I knew instinctively when that idea came, I accomplished all my goals. It was a unique, it's a unique idea. I'd never done anything like that. I never heard anything like that. That part of the equation was delivered. And the second part, it needs to be an easy guitar part. <laughs> well, I think it was the first time I ever wrote a guitar part that any guitar player can play. <laughs> and, uh, 
it was uh, it was really uh, one of the highlights of my career was performing it, and it's been performed three times. And I remember the first performance. I was just standing there, and I walked out, and I stood out in front of the audience. I mean, you know, sort of right in front, and I just hit that note, and I'm holding it. And then the orchestra starts to come in, and it was it was pretty hilarious, the uh, reactions in the audience. And some people got it. Some people just thought it was insane. You know, what is he doing? What, where, why isn't he flailing? Why isn't he shredding? And, uh, but the, uh, and I think the majority of the people really got it. The orchestra um, curators and um, the conductor, and they all enjoyed it very much. So that's uh, one way to find inspiration is to imagine, just you write down what you want, and it could be anything, anything. You're, you're the boss, you know. You, you, you say, I want to make a record, and I want it to be the heaviest thing that, that I ever did, or that, you know, and I want it to feel like this. And I want, so you're fertilizing the garden, so to speak. And then if you're open, you'll start seeing element, you know, cooperative components around you that will aid in the creation of this thing, whatever it is you decide. So that's the technique I really like to use. This other thing that I think ties into that is you have such a strong technical and academic background, like through high school theory class with Bill Westcott, Berkeley, Frank Zappa. And uh, have you found that over time you've embraced that more emotional, intuitive method rather than using conscious choices? I mean, in common terms, it would be referred to like left brain and, and right brain. I mean, you went in both directions very strongly, the academic and technical. Like, you know, you, you, uh, you know all the names of the notes, you know all the theory but you also have that open side. Did that develop over time or did you find yourself always doing that? Well, it's, it's hard for me to tell because I've always wanted it all, you know, and I was always fascinated with music theory. I wanted to understand it. Look, it looked like beautiful language and art to me. And I instinctively knew that if I understood all of the academics, that it would help me in that other side you know, going deeper than the technique, which is really where the good stuff comes from. You know, in any field, uh, whether it's sports or business or art, there's a period of time where you got to hone your vessel, where you got you to focus on the technique. And the amount of technique you need is dependent on what it is you want to do. You know, uh, I always liked the idea of being able to play the guitar a particular way. Uh, and writing a particular type of music. So I needed a lot of technique. I wanted to go much deeper than the technique. When you take someone like Bob Dylan, he doesn't need a lot of guitar technique to get his point across, you know? So each person has to balance how much technique they need uh, to get their point across. A lot of times it's, it's easy to get fascinated with the technique and, and carried away with it. And there's nothing wrong with that because there's people that enjoy watching people that are just incredibly amazing uh, with their technique but the longevity and the effect of a piece of music on somebody i believe has to do with the other dimension how deep you go beyond the technique so to speak that's always been a natural interest in me is having the academics and there were periods of time that i would focus on the academics and writing and the music would sound that way and i still do that sometimes just for as an expression but usually the, the the academics just become a tool. The technique becomes your creative tool as opposed to you being the tool of the technique, so to speak. Are you familiar with this kid named Dylan Beato, this eight-year-old kid that can instantly name and sing the notes in any double uh, polychord played on piano? Like his dad will press the sustain pedal on the piano and bang out four overlapping triads, and this kid can be like, you know, and sing all of them. You ever seen that? I've seen every clip he's done. I've spoken with his father. I believe that that kid is a, a revolution in uh, the idea of what humans are capable of with hearing music. I don't know how it's going to evolve in him. Sometimes that kind of, I didn't think that uh, that degree of perfect pitch was even possible because I've been transcribing music for many years, and uh, I was led to believe that the human ear can't hear more than three or four notes at a time. And this kid is doing stuff that's absolutely beyond, beyond. It's, it, was a, it was a shock. It was a shock when I saw him. 
it's very encouraging because if that's what the young ones are starting to come into the world with, we're in for some real serious movement in composition. He's a phenomenon. It's as if we didn't know that all of that was possible. And if that much is possible, even with just composition, what else is possible for humans to do? Anything. That's the thing. <laughs> Aside from transcribing, have you, have you ever tried to uh, develop those types of uh, almost superhuman uh, abilities? Did you ever set out to do that? Yes, I was fascinated with perfect pitch, and I wanted it, and I didn't really have it. I have pretty good relative pitch, but absolute pitch is a, a different ball game. In my early years, I went through these various techniques. I would go to sleep with a pitch in my ear, and I would just try to identify pitches. But I have to think, and I have to listen, and I have to kind of, and I haven't practiced it a lot. You know, I don't really need perfect pitch. But uh, I'm led to believe that it's not something you can develop. But Rick Beato, would, is a, uh, I think, is, a, is one of the authorities on that. And he ha he, his theory is, and maybe it's true, um, that it has to do with a certain gene that a select amount of people are born with. And that gene is in a different proportion in different cultures, like in China or mm. something. I think it's like... 60% of the people are born with this gene and in other parts it's different. But you have to embrace it when you're very young because there's a development period where babies and, and toddlers and stuff, they're, they're very open, they're very aware in a sense, you know, and, and they process things a particular way that we lose. We don't lose it, we just obscure it as we get older based on the conditionings of the world. If a child who has this particular gene is mentored properly, uh, there's no end to, you know, how their ears can be developed or other things, which is apparent because of Dylan. And, and yeah, man, that, when I saw that, it was like, okay, here we go. There's things that are going to be developed in people that are coming in the world that are completely off our radar right now because Dylan was completely off my radar. And this kid's like, what, eight years old? Yeah. <laughs> so it only makes sense because as I was going back to our original metaphysical boo -ha -ha, <laughs> the universe is expanding and continuing to uh, enlighten itself through us. And new, the, the young ones that are coming into the world now are equipped with different sets of awareness tools. And uh, because we're all standing on the shoulders of everybody that came before us, it's so arrogant for us to assume that we're, where we're at now is where we're at and that's all that we can go, you know. But there's things that are going to start happening that are going to be game changers. And in the music world, Dylan is a game changer. It'll be interesting to see what develops if he uh, starts composing or... Um... Well, we'll have to see because you can have uh, an intense degree of perfect pitch like Dylan and not be a very good musician. Yeah. You know, because the, that, that, that's deeper than the technique. He has, he has he, he's an example, as far as I know, and there might be others like him, like his little sister, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, who's doing the same thing. Yeah. Um, there might be people that have that. That's an in, incredible academics. Do you know what I mean? That's a, a, a magnification of any of the academics that we've seen before, but it's just a tool, you know, if he, it, it, it will help him to identify melodies in his head that then he can translate easy. But the, but the, but the bottom line is what's the quality of the melodies that he's hearing that comes from a completely different place than the academics. This is an example where the academics can help, you know, cause if he's going to go compose and he hears something in his head, there's nothing that he can't write down. But it's like, it's like poetry, you know, I mean, poetry is letters assembled a particular way and into words. And you can understand what a word means, but it's, it's, you can be a grammatical genius, but it's not the creative element. It's the mental element, so to speak. Hmm. And, and you got to find the balance between the two, you know, for you. Speaking of this, uh, what Rick Beato calls high information music, which I think is a great term. I don't know if he came up with it or not, but uh, how much 
time do you spend listening to classical music and high information music versus quote unquote popular music? Well, high information music is kind of a relative term because it's, it's going to be completely dependent on the listener. Uh, you can have two instruments that can create high information music, so to speak. But I understand what he's saying. For me, I, I kind of go back and forth. You know, usually if I'm listening, if I get a chance to listen to music, um, I'm listening to an audio book. <laughs> but uh, there's classical music that I love to listen to. And I'm exposed to a lot of things. And I find things that I like in all sorts of uh, genres. I wasn't always like that. But I get it from all over because like my uh, one son will listen to, you know, Julian listens to the heaviest of heavy metal you can possibly imagine. <laughs> and some of it's really good, you know, and he's, that's through the years, he's been my, uh, you know, my source of what's going on in the metal world. And then my son Fire is really into like uh, techno and beats and acid rock and, you know, all of these, all the, the technical music. Um, so I get to hear all the techno stuff that's coming out that's really cool because they're very uh, discerning listeners. <laughs> but then I like to listen to, well, just recently, for instance, I, I, I'm a big Led Zeppelin fan. It's just there from when I was a kid. So I always get everything that Paige puts out and I got the vinyl. So for a couple of weeks ago, every night I would just put on a Zeppelin record and listen to it on vinyl. But if I listen to classical music, which I do quite often, there's particular composers that I like. Um, in the beginning, when I was a young boy, I was exposed to the music in the house, which is usually um, pretty pretty conventional. But my parents had West Side Story, and that was really the bug that bit me in regards to composition, because it's the music that I heard that when I think what first lit me up in regards to composition, what's mm -hmm. capable, it was that. And it was a really good piece of music to hear at that time, because... It had all the elements that I loved, you know, it, that drama, theater, and you know me, I'm the, the ham is cooking, you know. <laughs> and uh, it had uh, historic melody and lyrics and all this stuff. Then when I was taking classes with Bill Westcott, he exposed me to, to conventional classical music, all the great composers, Mozart, Beethoven, Bach. And I liked it, you know, I, I, but it, it was kind of too predictable for me. It was almost too nice, you know. So then I, when I got into college, I started really listening to a lot of uh, contemporary composers. And that's when I, you know, the can of, of Stravinsky worms was opened. <laughs> and, uh, and then I said, one of the great things about going to Berkeley was uh, the music library that they had. It was like somebody opened the door and it was a bright, sunny, beautiful day out. And I was stuck in a room. And... Uh, I was able to hear all of Stravinsky and then like all of Maynard Ferguson and all of the Beatles and all of Zappa, you know, and all these things. So then my classical music interests gravitated towards more contemporary stuff. And, you know, for the past 15, 20 years, I guess my favorite composers would started out, well, you know, Frank uh, was one of the first exposures in an intimate way because Mm -hmm. I could see the scores. I could. I was working with him, and, but then there was, you know, Stravinsky, and in college I listened to a lot of like uh, the Luciano Berrio, and later in life too, and even now, my favorite composers are Berrio, uh, Georgi Ligeti, absolutely incredible composer, Zanakis. Zanakis was big for me. Elliot Carter, Edgar Varese. Edgar Varese's music is just, it's a study, and it's so rewarding. There's this composer, Magnus Lindbergh. Last I heard, he was uh, sort of the uh, director of the New York Symphony. This guy is new level stuff. I mean, his technique of composing, he uses technology, but his music is just, it's, it's very contemporary. See, that's the thing. A lot, of, a lot of contemporary music is unlistenable. Because it's the intellectual fascination of uh, exploring nothing but the technique. Hmm. <laughs> When you get someone like Verace, he goes way deeper than the technique, you know. Uh, but then there's some, there's some romantic music I still listen to. I, I occasionally will go back and listen to, you know, v Wagner operas, um, some, you know, like the Beethoven and the Mozart. I listen to that occasionally. But like I say, it's, it's beautiful and, and genius and all this, but it's a little predictable for me. I like 
the unpredictable. The other classical music that I, I like occasionally is sort of the romantic period. I'm, I'm a big Ravel fan, Debussy, and Mahler. Mahler is, uh, for me, huge. Um, I, there's nothing I enjoy more than sitting in my studio with these beautiful speakers I got listening to a Mahler symphony. Uh, I notice you don't mention Bartok. I'm curious of your thoughts on that. Uh, Bartok, sure, yeah. No, I'm, as I'm speaking to you, I'm looking at uh, uh, my collection of Bartok string concertos in manuscript form. Wow. They're on the shelf. And yeah, so the Bartok, for me, and this is just it, just, it means nothing. There's a little more intellect in it than the deeper than the intellect. Like, for, for, like, like someone like Carter, for me, there's more of a um, abstract freedom in it. Mm. And I love that. I love abstract freedom. It seems like uh, maybe it's not uncommon for a person who spends all their time playing one instrument to enjoy listening to like a totally unrelated instrument. For example, I don't really play piano and I'm absolutely horrible at it. I'm like a one finger kind of piano guy, but it's my favorite instrument to listen to. So does anything like that happen with you? Yeah, it's phenomenal. Like, uh, because when I look back, um, and when I look at myself now, I feel that music in itself always felt very natural. You know, I always had sort of a very easy, simple, there's a, there's a lot of simplicity in visualizing something musically and then translating it. But the thing where I'm not so uh, natural, which I say to people and they think I'm crazy, but it's like, it's like playing an instrument. You know, the, um, the guitar is the only instrument I can play. And I have to work really, really hard because I'm not natural. You know, I mean, I, I know this because I've taught many people and their ability to improve. It's just dwarfed mine. You know, I mean, if any of them put in the kind of time that I put in, <laughs> they would have at least my technique, if not a lot, lot more. But as I was mentioning before, that doesn't necessarily make you an effective great musician. It can make you a great player or technician, you know, and that's fine if that's what you're into. But I can, the, the odd thing is, and this is not uncommon for a lot of composers, is they can compose for any instrument. I can do that. You know, I can compose on a, for a, for a completely accomplished pianist, and I have. But I can't, I, I can't play the piano at all. It's the weirdest thing. And I've tried. I've tried, and I just was, you know, just like, I'm not even going to get into this. <laughs> <laughs> but I can go up to the piano and hit one, find one chord that I like and compose a symphony around it. You know, it's all the, 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 the visualization. And when it comes time to writing for various instruments in the orchestra, you just have to study what their capabilities are, what their limitations are, where they sound the best, you know, and that's just a study. It's just, the, it's the academic portion. Like if you're going to write for the harp, which is one of my favorite instruments to compose for, you really have to understand the mechanics of the harp and what a harp player can do. And, you know, because there's pedals that you have to keep track of and there's certain hand abilities and reaches and, you know, hand over hand and you have to write it a particular way so they understand it. And the one thing about the harp that's different than most any other instrument, except for maybe bowing directions with strings, is that the harpist will take any music you write and completely change it up. <laughs> You know what I mean? Hmm. Uh, to suit them. Now, when I say change it up, I don't necessarily mean notes, but the directions. You know, because with a harp, you got to write uh, pedalings, and I use pedal diagrams, and I, I, I forensically figure out what's, can they do this? Is it possible? And is this the right pedaling? Where was the pedaling at? Can they switch in time here? So you got to think of all these things. And then the harpist will just take it and eliminate all of your work and just make it work for them. And it's individual. And it's the same thing with bowing. I'll, I'll, I'll create, uh, I'll put bowings, bow, you know, the directions that the strings go with their bow on particular runs and notes and whatever, because I like that. I like getting in there and imagining it. I could see it all. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of times the concert master will just throw away your bowings and completely redo them, which is fine because they're experts. I mean, I've spent years transcribing Vinnie Kalayuta drum parts. <laughs> You know, and I, in my mind's eye, and I've written many drum parts, like written out. In my mind's eye, I see it, and I know what it can, what what can be done. But if you ever heard me play the drums, it sounds like a drunk falling down a flight of stairs. <laughs> so it's an interesting phenomenon. And then you get guys like like Prince, who wouldn't write the stuff, but 
he can play every instrument. You know, you give, you give him give him ten minutes on any instrument, and he'll get a song out of it. Well, he used to. You know, that's a, a natural talent for instruments, and I don't have that. How much um, notating do you do as it relates to your rock music? And it, so, something to point out here is, it, you know, it's almost like your rock music is kind of the the tip of the iceberg with all of the music stuff you do. Uh, one thought I have is like, how do you even have the time to have uh, all of this knowledge about classical music and composition when you're, you know, working full time as a <laughs> touring guitarist? So it's, uh, can you comment on that? Well, it's based on what your interest is and your ability to retain information. And I, my ability to retain certain things is, is, is really bad like names and phone numbers and mm. hotel room numbers and you know, <laughs> stuff like that or, or language. I've tried many times to learn many times to learn another language and I just don't seem to have the retention for it. But when it comes to music, it's like, I never, I never forgot it. Mm. It's like, I, I never learned it <laughs> because it was always there. I can't explain it really. So when, when I go to create something, whether it's with the rock band or a string quartet, you know, or an orchestra. You do what you, you you focus on whatever you're doing in that moment, and all of your tools come together. That doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to compose something and write it out for my band. I do do that occasionally. When I had the string band, uh, visual, uh, string theories with uh, the two violins, a lot of the music was composed because it had to be a particular way. You know, it wasn't just the third party musicians playing blues riffs, you know what I mean? It was it was highly orchestrated stuff. So if you watch that video and you're watching something like Angel Food or Now We Run or Ooh, it's all composed. It's all written out and given to them and the band and uh then we have to figure it out. So your your usage of notation is not something that you have ever stepped away from throughout your career? Have you just always been notating? In one way or another, but a lot of it's based on the musicians you're working with. Because some guys just don't read. And Frank, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of my whole, I was mentored by him in a sense, you know. I mean, just by watching the way he worked at such a young, impressionable age that I was at, I absorbed his M.O., which resonated with me beautifully because Frank did whatever he wanted by any means necessary. And he had guys in the band that couldn't read music at all, but they had something else. Mm -hmm. And he would, he would have them do, do that something else that they do well. And he would give the written parts to me or somebody else, you know, it worked out great, but you have to know what you're dealing with and what the best way to get what you want is. And in some cases, the best way is to write it out and give it to somebody that can read it. And in some cases, it's it's like, here's you, you give the guy the chord, and you say, okay, this, this is what we're doing. What are you going to do? <laughs> um, but I mean, as far as your own usage of notation, writing things out for yourself, have you continuously done that since you were in high school? Absolutely. If somebody gets an idea for a lyric, they write it down in their language. For me, if I get a, a melodic idea, I'll either, these days, I might just sing it into my iPhone, but or or I'll write it out. That's how a lot of my music was um, composed, like, uh, especially in the early days, like uh, an album like Flexible. Much of that stuff was composed on airplanes or in airports or hotels. Or, you know, and when I did all the orchestrations for um, sound theories, I was uh, on tour. I was constantly writing. For me, yeah. Like, for instance, what I love to do is find a weird chord on the guitar and then write it out in manuscript and then build synthetic scales around it and figure out all of its um, modes, which they're not conventional modes, they're all synthetic. And, you know, modes, once you understand uh, scales and how modes work, you realize that the modes have completely different flavors in them than their brothers or their, their sister scales, which are the same scales, just starting on a different route. So I love to create a synthetic scale and then build the chords off it. And then from there, you, you've, you've created a harmonic dimension that you can do anything with it. So but those, are the, those are the building blocks. I may just kind of sketch out a chord 
write a scale around it just so I can see what all the available tones are. Because that's easier for me than trying to just figure it out on the guitar. So I think we can probably wrap up by I wanted to ask you about this uh, American Youth Symphony show at Disney Hall you have coming up very shortly. I think it's in March. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on there? Yeah. Well, a very good friend of mine that I grew up with, Billy Sullivan, works very closely with the American Youth Symphony. You know, I started hanging out with them and, you know, they're looking for interesting events to raise awareness and money for their um, for the youth symphony. So they asked me if I would be interested in performing a piece of music that was written specifically for me. And I, th- I felt, yeah, I would, but I'm not going to have time to learn it. <laughs> you know? So why don't you want, you know, why don't, uh, can we think of something else? And they said, yeah, why don't we play some of your music? So, Hey, I'm down with that, you know? And, uh, I just asked them, what what would you like to perform? And they picked uh, four pieces of music, and I was really surprised at their choice, uh, but thrilled. And the first was uh, "There's Still Something Dead in Here," <laughs> <laughs> yeah. which is uh, which is a really I, I have an orchestration for it. It was called uh, it was a piece of music that I wrote for my first solo record, Flexible, and I actually wrote it on a plane. And it's funny because well, part of it was on a plane, but a lot of it was written in my studio at the time where I had a snake and the snake escaped and killed something in the wall of the studio, but it didn't eat it. So for about a week and a half, my studio smelled like, I can't even tell you, it was horrific. So I'm composing this piece of music with this stench. So (laughs) it kind of translated itself into the piece. And that turned into, there's something dead in here that appears on flexible and it's got like, I think, I think I did the arrangement for like 12 guitars and uh, a drum machine and a synthesizer. Now that was a piece of music that was completely written before anything was recorded. And I, I just recorded the score. And then um, I thought this would make a really great orchestra score someday. And that someday came with one of my performances with the North Netherlands orchestra so I expanded the piece and did a full orchestration. And it's a very dense, complex, atonal, chaotic kind of a piece of music. So maybe that's why they chose it, but I'm eager to hear it. <laughs> and then another piece they chose was uh, Helios and Vesta, which is a composition of mine that I really love. Uh, but, we, but we decided not to do it because there's instrumentation that's a little too difficult to pull together. So instead, we're going to be doing, they chose Stead in here, Kill the Guy with the Ball, which is where I come out and start playing with the orchestra. You're referring to the beginning of uh, the first, because that's a sort of a pair of piece of music, isn't it? The Kill the Guy with the Ball and the God Eaters. You're talking about the rock section, right? Yeah, the Kill the Guy with the Ball is a long, it's kind of a long piece of music that appears on Alien Love Secrets, and it's uh, basically just guitar, bass, and drums. And then it goes into a piece called The God Eaters, but what? But but in order to play it with an orchestra, I had to condense it quite a bit. It's much shorter. It's like a, four, a quarter of the length, and it's been performed many times and recorded and released with the orchestra. And uh, those those releases have attached to them the segue into uh, the God Eaters. But what I'm going to be doing at Disney Hall is strictly the portion that's kill the guy with the ball, and then um, the murder which I love performing because it's just total wide open space for the guitar. And, uh, and then Call It Sleep, which I've only performed once with an orchestra in the 90s, in the early 90s. So I'm working on that score right now because it's, uh, it needs uh, some beefing up. And that's, that's, it's interesting that they chose those pieces of music for this concert at Disney Hall. It's all my, it's really dense, heavy, dark stuff, except for Call It Sleep. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to being at that show. I've already got tickets, and I bought tickets for my friends as well, so we're going to be there. Oh, cool. I want to uh, thank you for being the first guest on this new version of the podcast. Well, right on, Carl, and good luck with it. Yeah, I'm glad we could talk about composition because you're so known for being a you know a guitar shredder. Everybody thinks of you as a guitarist, but I'd like people to know that there's a lot more going on there. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, well, you take care, buddy. We'll talk to you later. You too. See you later. I told you this was going to be a good episode. 
Thank you to Steve Vai for sharing with us, and thank you to everyone out there for listening. Remember, to help me make more episodes of this podcast, head over to patreon.com slash carlking. Also remember to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. I'll see you next time.